Hola, comrades! Today's topic of interest, innovation in gaming. Though innovation has been one of the most commonly espoused goals in gaming, lately, the idea of what constitutes innovation has become much more hotly debated. Games have always been part art and part technology, and the split between those who advocate for artistic innovation and those who advocate for technological innovation has never been wider. While games like Breath of the Wild and Skyrim impressed both technologically and artistically, increasingly, the most artistic innovation is found in the indie scene, while the most technological innovation is found in the mainstream AAA scene. Because of this, examining the difference between innovation in art and innovation in technology and identifying what exactly should constitute innovation in gaming is, I believe, a worthwhile endeavor. Innovation in art has always been a contentious topic. Innovation in technology, however, is not only supported, but lionized. When artistic movements emerge, they face significant opposition from the status quo, Impressionism was first used as an insult by those preferring a more realist style. More recently, postmodernism, which emerged in the aftermath of the madness of World War II, has taken heat from everyone from vapid reactionaries like Jordan Peterson to centrist world leaders like Emmanuel Macron. In contrast, technological innovation faces comparatively little opposition. The old technological giants may push back, like how IBM pushed back against Silicon Valley in the 80s when Silicon Valley started cutting into its market share. However, technological innovation is viewed by society as a whole as a positive. Those who do push back against it, whether because they're simply Luddites or because they have genuine ethical concerns, are roundly attacked with questions like, You wouldn't want to live without your computer, right? Or your iPhone? Or your television? So why do you hate tech? The major difference between innovation in art and innovation in tech is not, despite what Silicon Valley types opine, that only the latter improves society. I don't think anyone would seriously argue the world would be better off without the Renaissance painters, even though they were innovators in their time. Also silly would be to argue the world would be better without the likes of Hemingway or Joyce or Virginia Woolf, writers who faced a significant pushback in their era. They are still controversial nowadays, yes, but only the staunchest medievalists would suggest writing would be better now if these writers and others hadn't set ablaze the standards of their times, these standards that demanded ornamental, less personal, overly decorative books. No, the difference between innovation in art and innovation in tech is this. Challenging the technological status quo does not repudiate its intentions. What I mean is how technological objectives have stayed mostly the same. Make it faster, make it lighter, make it smarter. While Silicon Valley types like to position themselves as alternatives to the old Goliaths like IBM, see Apple's famous 1984 ad, they all have the same objective, to make loads of money. While many of these Silicon Valley types do want to change the world, profit is their number one goal. New technology replaces old technology, but the basic system does not change. BlackBerry might no longer be the dominant player in the smartphone industry, but it wasn't replaced because its ethos was rejected. It was replaced because it was unable to compete in an increasingly cutthroat industry. In art, however, the new isn't necessarily sleeker or faster than the old. Rather, it repudiates the entire value system of the status quo. This is why it is challenged. Postmodernism, for example, is a word not only associated with art, but also with philosophy and politics. It's a value system explicitly rejecting the modernist viewpoint that new technology and styles and methods of thinking will lead to complete understanding of the world and elimination of its evils. Traveling backward in time, modernism itself was a reaction to the Second Industrial Revolution in the second half of the 19th century. 
as well as to the development of new sciences. Without the development of psychoanalysis, for instance, the stream of consciousness technique used ingeniously and evocatively by Joyce and Virginia Woolf would never have been created. Going back further, Romanticism was both a reaction against the Enlightenment idea that the world could be completely explained through logic and reason, and a response to the promise of reshaping the world spreading throughout Europe in the aftermath of the French Revolution. Innovation in art does not emerge out of a desire to make as much money as possible. It emerges out of a desire to tear down an artistic establishment the innovators either believe is out of date or believe was never legitimate. With these differences between the two types of innovation established, let's examine them as they apply to video games. The technological progression of video games is a fairly standard, if unusually compelling, story. After games made the jump from arcades to home consoles, they initially struggled. The great video game crash of 1983 threatened to destroy the console market entirely. But Nintendo almost single-handedly saved it by releasing the Famicom in Japan and the NES in America. After console gaming was established with Super Mario Bros. and the original Legend of Zelda, it quickly started booming. The console wars between Sega and Nintendo were great for the industry. Like most eras of rapid technological advancement, there were clear goals companies were progressing toward. Constantly, innovation was correlated with more powerful machines because these more powerful machines could produce more sophisticated graphics. The idea of a more sophisticated graphical style being automatically considered better would not be challenged for years. This era of rapid technological innovation ended when the three major gaming companies, Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo, decided to take different approaches. Microsoft and Sony continued to dedicate themselves to realistic graphics, while Nintendo embarked on a wildly successful experiment with motion controls. In the long run, neither approach worked. For Nintendo, the Wii was a massive hit, but the Wii U was an unmitigated disaster. Neither Microsoft nor Sony had a failure on the level of the Wii U, and because of their systems, they were able to attract a lot of third-party developers, but they had trouble distinguishing themselves from each other, and as graphical gaps between new generations of systems became smaller and smaller, their constant boasts of realistic graphics became more and more hollow. As pursuing technological innovation is rapidly yielding diminishing results, artistic innovation is a more promising path to follow. The story of artistic innovation in gaming is less straightforward. Many of the early popular games were fantastical. There are three major reasons for that. Number one, as gaming is simply a matter of code, creating a fully fledged fantasy world is not more difficult than creating a realistic world. In fact, during the early days, when graphics were necessarily simplistic, creating a fantasy world was easier than creating a realistic world. Differentiating two different humans was hard in the early days of gaming, while differentiating a person from an evil monster was easy. This is related to why Pixar didn't make a feature focusing on humans until The Incredibles. Making a bunch of people we are able to accept as distinct and human is hard. Number two, many of those who bought early video games were those who loved computers. And the Venn diagram between 80s computer nerds and fantasy superfans is, if not a circle, then something close to it. Fantasy games were easy to sell. Number three. Gaming is differentiated from other art forms primarily by its interactivity. While our world is not short on ideas and situations that can be mined for aching drama, it is short on ideas and situations that are engaging to play through. A divorced man, returning drunk from a meaningless sexual encounter to his empty apartment and his empty life, may be narratively compelling, but there's nothing for a gamer to do. Fantasy protagonists, however, swing swords and cast spells and travel across vast lands. Their journeys require actions that are interesting from an interactivity standpoint. 
Because development on early games was simple and short, and because developers did not have to work on creating complicated narratives because gameplay was so predominantly the focus, video games were heavily franchise-based even compared to films. These early franchises, like Mario and Zelda and Final Fantasy, continue to dominate gaming today, which means artistic innovation in gaming is largely the tale of artistic innovation in these franchises. Of these three, Mario has innovated the least artistically. Has the ethos of the franchise changed? Not really. Later Mario games are certainly more polished than earlier entries, sure. And the gaming environment around Mario has changed, sure. An entire Mario game being shelved for being too difficult, and another game being reskinned and made a replacement would cause an outcry these days, but back then, when it was done with Super Mario Bros. 2, few North Americans even knew. But the games are still about saving the princess and stopping Bowser. What's changed is how the franchise has carried out this ethos. In 2006, when games were all about being grandiose and cinematic, Mario went to the cosmos. More recently, with more of an emphasis being placed on nostalgia, the latest Mario game, Odyssey, is more like Mario 64. Now, Zelda and Final Fantasy have innovated more. The original Zelda game lacked many of the grandiose trappings that would go on to define the series. While the series has never completely pushed against its earlier entries, like how we see the new Star Wars films pushing against the limits of the old movies, we do see in Twilight Princess a desire to fit the zeitgeist of more dark and realistic looking games after Wind Waker was accused of looking too cartoony, and in Breath of the Wild, a desire to fit the zeitgeist of vast open world games after Skyward Sword was accused of being too stilted and formulaic. These games also innovated artistically, not just in their franchises, but in the context of the entire gaming landscape. Twilight Princess proved that a dark and bleak fantasy gaming world could use a, a washed out, more monochromatic color palette for ethereal, disturbing effect rather than to be boring and lifeless. Breath of the Wild, likewise, proved that the Zelda spirit of treasure, possibly lurking in every crevice or behind every bush, could be extended to a massive, immersive world. Conversely, Final Fantasy innovated narratively. Final Fantasy IV proved, as I discussed in my video on it, that games could have stories as poignant and powerful and nuanced as those in film and literature. And with that proved, Final Fantasy VI proceeded to deliver one of the best narratives of the generation in any medium. With its deft handling of themes of identity and loss, its bombastic, frantic nihilist of a villain, Kefka Palazzo, and its mature analysis of the conflict between natural forces, symbolized by magic, and a technology, it's a true fantasy masterpiece. Again, artistic innovation is not, unlike technological innovation, about progressing in a straight line. It's not about the drops of sweat forming on a football player's face being portrayed accurately in the next Madden game. It's about repudiating the ethos of the status quo. And there is no more striking example of that than Final Fantasy taking the focus of gaming in a more story-heavy direction. Of course, if we're going to talk about games changing the idea of what their art form is, we have to talk more about indie games, which have drastically taken games in a more experimental direction. The whole idea of platformers and RPGs being about heroes fighting against a great evil has been smartly subverted by games like Braid, which in its ending reveals you to be the villain while also serving as commentary on atomic weapons, and Undertale, where approaching the game like a traditional destroy-everything RPG makes you a genocidal monster. These games are more cerebral, more transgressive, and more emotive. Technological innovation remains impressive for a short period of time. Narrative innovation lasts. A game that was a technological marvel 20 years ago may look hopelessly dated, but a game that was a narrative marvel 20 years ago may not be as impressive these days, but it's still a captivating, evocative experience. 
Final Fantasy VI may be an SNES RPG, but because it focused on artistic innovation, it still mesmerizes RPG fans today. No one plays Mario 64 or Ocarina anymore to gawk at the graphics like they did in the late 90s. People keep playing these games because they're well-structured, well-designed works of art. While both technological innovation and artistic innovation are important, artistic innovation is more laudable because it's not just a series of replaceable stones leading in a certain direction, but a lasting, eloquently articulated statement of values and beliefs and perspectives. If you proposed a game like Life is Strange, or Firewatch, or even The Last of Us 25 years ago, you would have been told to make it into a book, or film, or TV series. That these games were made is in part a matter of technological innovation, as they would not have been impressive or even possible on early gaming systems, but it is more a matter of artistic innovation. 25 years ago, the idea of what games could be did not include a skewing traditional excitement, stopping a player from feeling in complete control for the sake of art, and prioritizing narrative. Even games like Final Fantasy VI made sure to indicate that they were games first and foremost. And yes, there were visual novels and point-and-click games, but those were effectively ghettoized off. And even these still prioritized wish-fulfillment and archetypical characters. The Last of Us is more about two broken people learning to bond, than fighting off hordes of zombies, and the story is the main draw. Firewatch is a game where the silence, far from something the game believes should be minimized, is largely the point. And Life is Strange, rather than indulging in its fantastical elements, uses them to enhance its grounded, intimate storytelling. The arrival of these games is not an inevitable result of technological innovation. It only occurred because developers and writers who wanted more than standard, vapid stories in their games made their voices heard. Anyway, if you liked what you saw today, consider donating to my Patreon so I can produce even more innovative content. Also, don't forget to like, and comment, and subscribe, all that artistic stuff. Adios, comrades!